it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our World Food Day celebration. World Food Day is held every 16th of October to promote awareness and most importantly, action against hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition that affect hundreds of millions of people across the globe. This year, FAO and IRI are celebrating World Food Day here at IRC with the theme, Our Actions Are Our Future. A zero hunger world by 2030 is possible. This will be divided into two parts, a ceremonial activity followed by a panel discussion among representatives of key actors in achieving zero hunger. So without further ado, let's move on to the ceremony. May I please ask Dr. Kadiraisen, Dr. Morell, Dr. Makello, Ms. Carolyn and Mr. Lincoln to come up to the stage, please. On the stage, the empty bowl represents where we are now, a world suffering from hunger and malnutrition. The act of filling the bowl with rice will represent our collective commitment in shaping the future by taking action today. Representing the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Asia and Pacific, Dr. Kundavi Kadiraisen. Representing the International Rice Research Institute, Director General Dr. Matthew Morell. Representing the Science and Technology Community, IRI Technology for Development Lead, Ms. Carolyn Flory. Representing youth and the private sector, Rice Incorporated co-founder, Mr. Lincoln Lee and representing government and national institutions, Director of Technology Transfer, Knowledge Management and Capacity Building for the Kenya Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Irrigation, Dr. Margaret Mckellar. On the count of three, may I ask our participants to pour their rice into the bowl? Here we go. Three, two, one. The bowl of rice, filled rice now, symbolizes a world free from hunger and malnutrition by 2030. This ceremony also shows that no single actor can fill the bowl alone. We need to act in unison and partnership to achieve zero hunger. Thank you to our representatives for participating in this ceremony. May I request Dr. Kadiraisen and Dr. Morel to return to their seats and the others to please join me here on the stage. Okay, let's move on to the second part of our program, the panel discussion. The theme for the discussion today is towards achieving a zero hunger world by 2030. How can youth lead the way? Sustainable Development Goal 2, hung, Zero Hunger, aims to end all forms of hunger and malnutrition by 2030, making sure all people, especially children, have access to sufficient and nutritious food all year round. To achieve it, we need to start engaging our future leaders, the youth, and help shape their actions. At the beginning of 2012, the world reached a historic milestone as the human population surpassed 7 billion, with more than half those people under the age of 30. In other words, we now have over 3.5 million agents of change. Now more than ever, investing in this generation must be a global priority. At IRI, we envision young agricultural scientists developing innovations that will profoundly influence the way we grow food and distribute it. We see young farmers and agricultural entrepreneurs embracing interventions and techniques to produce foods that are nutritious, affordable, and sufficient for everyone on the planet. 
We call these young people Generation Zero because we believe this will be the generation that will make zero hunger possible. To start the discussion, let's go to Mr. Lee to get his perspectives on the role of youth in ensuring zero hunger through agribusiness. In particular, what in your experience and um, has, has been the factors that you think motivates youth to go into agribusinesses and agriculture? And what can we do to inspire more young people, young men and women to do the same? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I believe what inspires, at least myself and my team, I just like to acknowledge my team, Kisam and Rachel in the front. Um, I believe what inspires youths are two main things. One, that we want to know what we're doing has a purpose and has real life impact when we start an enterprise. And second, uh, just like any other individual, uh, we want to have a good career. We want to make sure it's profitable and we can live a good life with it. And actually, achieving zero hunger and uh, engaging in agriculture entrepreneurship fulfills the first. Because throughout our, uh, at least our team's journey, we went through several, several uh, startup accelerators and we actually saw a wide variety of uh, teams that were focused in agriculture because they, all, they had, because they felt that due to the, I guess, slightly underdeveloped nature of the agriculture industry, it provided a lot of room for innovation and new ideas where uh, youths could unleash their full creativity. Mm -hmm. And we saw everything from AI in irrigation to mobile applications for fertilizer. Um, and so the motivation is definitely there. Um, they definitely felt motivated to tackle food security uh, with a focus in smallholder farmers. It's just the second part. There is a perception among the youth, whether fortunate or unfor uh, probably unfortunate, that um, engaging in agriculture is not a very attractive industry uh, and that you basically won't be able to earn a lot of money. And because of this preconceived notion, when we engage in agriculture entrepreneurship, most youth entrepreneurs face a problem because more often than not, the industry is very fragmented. And so it becomes very difficult to implement their ideas. Mm -hmm. And so many of them give up or it sort of solidifies their already preconceived perception that it's not as profitable and I should do other things. So I believe what uh, needs to happen to fix this is we need to provide proper incentives for them to continue the enterprises. And the only way to do this is to create a, not one solution, but an ecosystem that supports this network. In particular, three things. The first is investment. So I think only about 30% of all startup capital goes into rural-based startups, while 70% goes to urban-based ones, which doesn't make sense because the urban population depends on the rural population for sustenance. Yeah. And second is education. So there is a lack of awareness among youths about the problems in agriculture and how it actually can help them create a purpose-driven enterprise. But more than that, it's also that traditional curriculum doesn't really cover the basics of agriculture. Um, it's not that we have, everyone has to study agriculture since young, but they should have a general knowledge of it. And thirdly, and probably the most important, is institutional support, both from the private and public sector, um, not just for mentorship and expertise, but to facilitate the implementation of their ideas. Because for us, the real change came when, um, thank, uh, we're really thankful to Erie because uh, the real change for us came when we were able to implement our solutions. And when we went to all these accelerators, we saw that teams who were able to run a pilot or at least see their idea come to life were a lot more successful than those who just kept talking about it. Right. And so there needs to be a proper system to facilitate that. I believe with all these incentives in place, um, youths will be able to fulfill their potential uh, in achieving zero hunger. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, we hear a lot about the role, the very important role youth can play in digital agriculture, and also digitization being one of the most important factors that can attract youth into agriculture and agribusinesses. What's your perspective on that, and what do you think it would take to make that a reality? Um, thank you for the question, Ranjita, um, and thank you for the invitation to participate um, in this very esteemed panel. So when I think about uh, the use of technology, 
I always go back to the challenges, right? So no matter what the sector, be it agriculture, be it health, education. And so I really want to, to start, take a step back and think about what are the core challenges for why youth are not engaged in agriculture right mm -hmm. now. And so Lincoln mentioned um, a number of them that are affecting um, our particular sector and thinking about farming as an occupation that is very difficult, physically, mentally. Um, it's one where there's a perceived lack of opportunity in incomes, low productivity, um, that means that youth are not going to achieve the same incomes that they think that they could get in urban areas. And there's also a social status associated with being a farmer that we have to combat as well. Um, a number of pieces of research have indicated that even parents are hoping that their children do not become farmers, that, that they take the next step um, as the next generation in, in their careers. And so when I think about the use of technology in agriculture, I really think about it in addressing these particular challenges and not sort of throwing digital tools at, at farmers and agricultural extension workers. But how can we use technology to make, to become more effective, more productive um, in, in agriculture? And so I just wanted to give a few examples of, of how um, we've seen this being done both at ERI and, and in the sector overall, and thinking about how to engage youth using, using technology and digital tools. So as Lincoln mentioned, you know, incomes and productivity um, have room for improvement in agriculture. So how can, so the question that I think is, how can we use technology to increase incomes, to increase productivity? And so one of the sort of fun, fundamental sort of binding constraints there is um, a lack of information. Information asymmetries where farmers and agricultural extension workers don't have access to the information that can increase productivity, that can make, um, that can increase yields at the end of the day. So, for example, there's an, a new social enterprise in operating in East Africa called Farm Inc. Um, that we recently, that we've known about and um, also saw at the Big Data Platform Convention in Nairobi mm -hmm. um, last week, whereby they're partnering with another CG center um, on livestock research and they're using Facebook Messenger, a platform that youth are already engaged in, that they're already accessing for entertainment purposes, and it's a peer-to-peer -peer learning network. So using machine learning, they're getting a lot of data in. What types of questions are other farmers asking about livestock? And how can they provide information from their peers to other farmers? So you're using a platform that's popular and already exists, and also providing them with actionable information and creating farmer groups and, and sort of social um, recognition recognition amongst them. Similarly, other ways to, to increase and address these productivity, at Erie we have a platform called Rice Crop Manager, and we work very closely with the Department of Agriculture in the, of the Philippines and also state governments in India to provide crop management information, fertilizer and nutrient management information to farmers in these geographies. And this platform has been proven to increase yields and also increase incomes of farmers who have been using them that, that provide site-specific nutrient management recommendations to farmers. And so these are two examples of, of specific applications of digital technology. Another way is as you think about the agricultural value chain, other ways that digital technology can be used at, at different points. So post-harvest is another example. Mm -hmm. When we think about the, the amount of post-harvest loss that occurs in the, in the rice season, how can we address that using technology? So for example, colleagues at Erie are working on a platform called Easy Harvest that optimizes the, the access to combine harvesters so that they, so that farmers are able to use and access combine harvester, harvesters at the exact moment um, that they should to avoid post-harvest loss. There's a similar platform in Sub-Saharan Africa called Hello Tractor. So both of these platforms are sort of the, the Uber of, of um, mechanization in agriculture, but using those digital tools, using tools that youth already have in the palm of their hands. And my last point I just want to, to kind of bring it back to what Lincoln actually has already mentioned in thinking about um, the interconnectivity of all of these things. How can we get youth engaged is really not just agriculture alone. It's thinking about the ecosystem, the enabling environment for all of this. And so I was excited to, to hear the IFAD president um, yesterday, and I, I just wanted to quote him because I think this quote sort of summarizes how, how can we think about a holistic approach to digital agriculture. And he noted that in today's world, when we talk about rural transformation, my best example is that the youngsters need to make sure WhatsApp is working. 
this is almost non-negotiable. So if we want to have, make sure that people are not, that youth are, are staying in rural areas, we have to make sure that they're connected. This means infrastructure, access to WhatsApp, access to the internet and connectivity. It means access via roads so that they can go to urban centers and make sure that they get back within two, and two to three hours um, after the weekend ends. So thinking about all of the interplay between these different sectors. Um, and so I'm very excited to, to hear from our colleague from Cairo as well as in terms of a government perspective um, in integrating all of these two. Thank you. So that's a nice um, yeah, segue into what I was going to ask uh, Margaret. Kenya and Africa in general has one of the youngest populations of the world and also some of the highest youth unemployment rates. Um, and we are continuing to battle hunger in many parts of the, of the continent and in many pockets of the society. So talking about how important the innovation ecosystem and enabling environment is, how do you think the government can support engagement of youth in agriculture? What do you think are the untapped opportunities that could if I may use the word, entice youth into the agricultural sector. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would just wish to say thank you for inviting me here. It's really indeed a privilege and uh, to be able to talk also on behalf of African governments. Um, my examples might possibly be more on Kenya because that is where I'm more familiar. You've just rightly said that uh, we have a high population of unemployed youth mm. they are in the rural areas, they provide labor, mm. but they still want to lead a good life. Mm. But the youth have spoken through him. They know what they want, and it is now up to us to listen. Mm. And they have been speaking. One time I was also a youth, and somebody was talking for me, trying to <laughs> plan for me what is good. Now I'm seated here, listening to the youth, understanding what exactly they want, and be part of the team that will formulate policies that will enable the youth to tap their uh, potential. The mistake we were making earlier was we thought youths are for, to provide labor. We forgot to remember that they also have inspirations, that they know what they can do. All they want is that safe environment that enabling environment where to exploit the potential and therefore make it um, agriculture an area of interest. He has just said, we want to live a good life at the end of the day. So what is this that we need to do? Now, with all that background, most of the African presidents have taken it upon themselves to appreciate the importance of the youth because there was a World Bank report on mm. uh, the comment that said, we have a gold mine in our youths who sit at 60%. And if we tap on that 2030, we will not be talking of hunger anymore. And therefore, what is this we are doing? So the president first uh, declared, during the Malabo declaration, that we are going to deliberately uh, ensure that 30% of the youths get employed, uh, or rather get involved in agriculture and therefore get employment through agriculture. Now, after that, there have been other efforts in respective countries to see how best to tap on the youth energy uh, to ensure that they are productive. Because, you know, a productive youth, you are able to also save them from so many other social ills that are in the society. And uh, we have, like in Tanzania, the digital platforms have been set up, the e-platforms, and you find we have like e tukuze in, uh, in Tanzania, we have MFAM in Kenya, where they are using these platforms to market, to, to uh, rather connect the young farmers to the market, because they know that with the market, then I'm a guarantee of an income and good, li good living. Even um, after all this is done, they'll need support. The USAID came in very strongly uh, to support with about 34 million US dollars uh, to support agriculture run by the, the youth. And uh, 
the major successes are in West Africa on cashew nut, on um, oh, cocoa, and other cereals. And uh, I'm just, I was just excited when I was, before I came here, I was watching a video on a young youth in Ghana, not this, with a master's in computer science, doing agribusiness on cassava. Mm -hmm. Because the, he targeted uh, the industrial starch factory mm -hmm. who needed the cassava. And him, he knew he gets money from here and he'll be able to buy food for his family and make good money for himself. And he was proudly there riding on a, a, a tractor. And I said, I think this is the right documentary to show to all the youth and say, what we are doing is provide you with the basic knowledge on read and write and understand, mm -hmm. and therefore jump in on an opportunity, take the risk jump on the opportunity and make your life better. Kenya purposely listened to the youths like him, about 400 of them. There was a conference okay. in Kenya in 2015, and the youths talked, not us talking for them. And therefore there was a deliberate effort to uh, develop a strategy, agribusiness strategy for youths that tapped on the policy that was uh, uh, set up in 2006, which didn't, was just talking about capacity building and uh, giving them the knowledge in agriculture, but this one is uh, agribusiness per se. And this one has been rolled out because in Kenya, the agriculture is a devolved function. The county governments were also looped in. FAO were members of the team that also developed the strategy, the Minister of Agriculture, uh, USAID uh, uh, Department all contributed to ensure that these youths uh, we clearly target what they need uh, in life. In the Ministry of Agriculture, there has been set up a new State Department of Agricultural Research, that's where I sit, mm -hmm. to look at the policies that will influence the agribusiness uh, in my country. And this one goes with the, now the students who are undertaking agricultural research in CALRO and other research organizations. When you make your recommendations, what is the policy brief that you can generate from there, which now will inform the department to look at the policies that will favor the, the agribusiness sector uh, in the country. I can name so many other uh, countries uh, that also are doing the same, and they were all mentioned during the AGRF 2018 in Kigali and the youths were given an opportunity to, to, to say what they feel, and Digital World was really the in thing. You know, there is swag. When you talk like I'm using drones, um, developing an app, all this, and if that is what makes you happy, and there is an opportunity, why not? And therefore, we have to look at the policies that will allow the use of drones, even in my country like Kenya, because we look at drones as something else, that can be used by the wrong people. And therefore, how, what are these policies that have to be in place? And that is the, the, the area where we are. One of the speakers, Dr. Osani, I think, said he listens to music and he internalizes that. And we are saying, if we use youth as ambassadors of delivering agriculture messages to their fellow youths through music, they will all dance to the music and listen to the message. And you'll find that some of these youths are also directly involved in uh, agriculture. Oh. So they'll be talking about themselves, like the one in Kenya who was uh, keeping rabbits. And he said, Tukuza um, agriculture, that is, uh, uh, take up agriculture because it has made me who I am today. And he was really proud to be among the 400 youths uh, that were involved. So. The purpose of us as a government to be here is to listen to the youth, understand what is constraining them getting into agriculture uh, as a business. And somebody said, you use the cool name for agribusiness, and it's called agripreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I think that one will make you even say, yes, I'm doing agri agripreneurship. Uh, because, you know, the name it's in itself is swag. And therefore, 
those are small things that you look at, we might ignore them, but they really make a whole difference in the life of a youth who needs to also come and take advantage of the opportunities that we have in agribusiness. On finances, we are saying youths need that support, but there's nothing for free because it's a business. And therefore, we must have a way of the policy, and the policies are already in place, like for example in Kenya, we have the Uwezo Fund, we have the Youth Enterprise Fund, you don't need the collateral, but you'll be better supported if you're in a group. Mm -hmm. Form groups. And we know that when you are in a group, then there is the economies of scale of your produce. Get into value addition. If I want to start a business to sell water, I will pay rent mm -hmm. to, uh, to get the premise where I'll sell, I'll, I'll sell my water. What is so difficult if I lease land to do agriculture? Because saying that there is no, they have no access to land, I think is a defeatist way of looking at it because you can deliberately lease and we have very clear land policies on leasing, you enter into contracts for this period of time and you should be able to or do your business because so long as you have a business plan, you know by this time I'll break even. So there are so many other um, opportunities and in Kenya, we have the big four agenda Mm -hmm. There is the company called Trigger Foods mm -hmm. that has come in very strongly to help marketing of the farm produce by the, the mm -hmm. everybody else, but I think they target more the youth, whether you are selling the farm produce or you are buying to go and sell elsewhere. So this kind of environment where we are in, uh, trying to find um, some to ease the marketing and the tap on the market so that we they are not exploited by the middlemen is an area also that we have focused on. I think I can talk forever, but I know <laughs> that the message for our youth is the world is now yours. Take us places and make sure there's no hunger in Africa and the world. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And we can listen to you forever if we had some more time. Um, fascinating insights and I'd love to ask you more questions but I don't want to monopolize this um, so we, but we do have some time for questions so so to broaden that conversation we created two platforms that will give everyone a chance to be heard both here in the room and from across the globe so the first is through Mentimeter to pose your question go to menti.com and use that code. Get your cell phones out. Start doing that. Um, type in your questions. All questions will soon uh, go online and we'll be able to choose from there. Uh, you can do that now. And we also uh, used Facebook and we invited people to share questions a while ago and we received actually quite a lot of good feedback so we'll choose from these questions that we have collected through the Facebook but also from some of you sitting here today let's see what we got and we'll pick a few from there hmm Okay, I, I thought I saw an interesting question there, saying how can young people help a developing country like Nepal achieve its, you know, uh, zero hunger and uh, nutrition objectives? Lincoln, you have a lot of experience in Myanmar, which is also a developing and a rapidly transforming agricultural economy. Any would you like to share your views on that? Um, in, particularly in developing countries, uh, especially in Myanmar where we worked, we noticed two very interesting things about the youths there and the role that they could play in achieving, helping achieve zero hunger. So when we went around to do our market surveys and visited the farmers' houses, we noticed that all the farmers had framed photos of their children because they were obviously really proud of them for being the first uh, in their family to go to university to achieve a proper education. 
And the second thing was when we were going around in Myanmar, we actually met a lot of, uh, I guess, children of farmers. Mm -hmm. And they were very interested in what we did. But when we asked them, uh, would you like to be a farmer? Uh, they said no, <laughs> because we feel that the effort we put in is not equivalent to what we get back. Um, but then, then we asked them a follow-up, then why are you following us around? Uh, and they told us that, well, because we believe your service can help our parents. And that actually offered us a very, uh, like we realized that it, it became a very exciting opportunity. These youths offer a very exciting opportunity for adoption of technology and services that could help their parents. Because more often than not, these, they, have, they are the bridge between the two worlds. They grew up in farms, so they understand the lifestyle, they understand the day-to-day -day struggles of their parents, but at the same time, they've been exposed to technology and modern innovations in the cities and the internet. And more often than not, they're more tech-savvy. So they're more open to technological innovations, and they can be a platform to actually convince their parents that uh, this is the way forward. And sometimes, more often than not, their, uh, farmers don't need to be convinced, they just need to understand. And it sometimes is very hard coming from a external point of view to explain it to them. But when it comes from your own children, uh, it makes a difference. Um, and so I feel that's the role that uh, youths in developing nations can actually play. They can be the bridge between, um, I guess, a more underdeveloped rural agriculture industry and the speed at which technology is evolving in our world today. Thank you. And the other question that I picked up, thought was interesting was, how can you use design thinking as a tool to attract or to engage youth? Any thoughts on that? Um, anyone on the panel? Sure. So design thinking is really based in understanding the experience of the user. So um, what you know, uh, ha happens sometimes in, de in international development is a lot of sort of prescription of solutions, right, um, for, for everyone, not just the youth. And so design thinking, I think the unique role there is to really understand what is the experience, what is a day in the life of someone that's following Lincoln around in, in rural Myanmar? Why are they doing that? Asking those questions, seeing how are they interacting in the markets? How are they interacting with their parents? How are they interacting with mobile telephones? And trying to understand all of these different pieces so that the solution is, is not a great term, but sort of the program or, or the initiative that we are offering is something that actually makes sense for them. Mm -hmm. um, and not just assuming, um, and Ranjita, I know that, that you are, are a specialist and an expert in this area, and so I've heard you say this. Um, we can't take you oh. as sort of a, a big group, right? It's not the same, it's not just the youth of the world. Um, and so design thinking really lets us hone in on what are the binding constraints, what are the challenges that youth in Kenya face that are going to be different than the youth in Myanmar, that are different than the youth in Nepal. Thank you. Um, and, and the other question that I picked up uh, is about what cloud-based technologies are available that youth can use. You mentioned some of it, Carolyn, in your um, intervention, but um, any, anything else that we could add to that discussion? Um, Cloud-based technology. I mean, there are a lot of, and we discussed a few of them um, in terms of the use of, club, of technology in general and sort of um, one of the other things that's exciting as we think about cloud-based technologies is, is the use of data um, and how all of these different platforms that are collecting information about farmers, again, we can have a whole other session on data privacy and security, um, but how you're collecting that information that can inform the information and inform the real-time decision-making for farmers, for agricultural extension workers, for government, um, that, that's very exciting as, as we move forward as well. Thank you. Um, and the other thing, I think something that, you know, we've been alluding to in, in our discussion about perceptions and how important they are in, in you know, uh, getting youth to engage in agriculture or even the parents not being you know, very supportive of that. And how do we make those cultural shifts happen? Uh, you know, letting, sort of helping the parents and the children dispel those perceptions that might not always be right. So that was, I did pick up that question from there, but I'm using different words. Uh, yeah, I think on that one, the, the most important, according to 
what I've observed is the role models. The role models and the ambassadors uh, that will be out there talking to our youth, talking to our parents, talking to our communities. Mm. And they could use several fora. I mentioned the uh, music, I mentioned uh, uh, attending uh, some of the meetings, purpose mm. that. Then we also have exhibitions and agrotechs. In Kenya, we have ASK shows. Uh, all these platforms provide mm. the, the, the youths, the, the parents, the children to understand because we invite these people to showcase uh, mm. what is happening and they're so proud of what they're saying. So that ambassador will say, okay, if my son is an engineer, electrical engineer, and is able to undertake agriculture as he's making it, this other person, my son, my own son, is also an engineer, and they're struggling to look for a job that is not there, and mm. they're doing so badly you can now change the conversation and discuss and say, look, if he can make it, you mm. can also make it. Thank you. Oh, well, we could go on and on. Uh, I don't want to eat into everybody's lunch time. So one last question again that I picked, up, picked from there and I love, I would have asked that same question. We keep talking about youth as if it's one homogeneous group. All these decades or centuries, every time we talked about farmers, who comes to your mind? The man with the plow. And these days, unfortunately, I have a feeling we are slipping, in, slipping into something like that for youth. Youth, who comes into your mind? A young man. Yeah, trying to do something in agriculture. Let's not forget young men and young women face very different challenges, very different opportunities. So let's think of young women for a little bit and then say, what kind of policies, what are the special constraints that they might be facing? How do we address that issue? In fact, uh, the, the gender segregated data is really important for us to mm -hmm. understand what they, they, they the, the women or the young ladies, the youths, even the people living with the disabilities, mm. so that we target uh, specifically. Uh, so that, for example, our women uh, are supposed to get married and leave the home yeah. Yeah. to go where the husband comes from. And uh, therefore, you are not really given the same playing field at home like your brother. And therefore, if we now target the young women mm. in agriculture, then we now have to consider some of those. They'll get married, they will, uh, they will have children, they'll have careers, and they also want to look beautiful at the same time. And sure. therefore, what are these specifics that mm. we want to look at? That these others with the disabilities, mm. what are we targeting them to do? So that we purpose, to uh, have policies that will protect them, that will safeguard them in whatever they are doing. Mm -hmm. And the same to the young men or uh, boys. Mm -hmm. As they grow, there is that delicate transition where they need to make these decisions. And therefore, a lot is expected from them. Now, how can we harness that extra energy at that point in time just to ensure that they focus and even them, they all now look at it like, if I'm not an, a computer engineer, if I'm, I've not developed an app, then I'm a lesser person. Because the ego for our young men for sure is real. Mm. And there is that competition among peers that I should be better than you. Not necessarily to progress yourself, but just to be better than the other person. So looking at all this, then we have to look at what avenues do we have to bring them to a level to buffer them uh, so that they're able to think through the decisions they make. And I still insist mentors come in handy. Let them look up to the role models out there and you tell them, I went through this, I made it. So you can too. Thank you very much. Extremely rich discussion, and as I said, we could go on and on, but I guess we need to conclude it. But before 
concluding, I, I'd like, I mean, there was a lot to take away from there. Let me, you know, say the two or three big things that kind of stuck with me. I think for me, the first and the foremost was listen to the young people. Let them have an opportunity to have their voice out there. We keep making a lot of assumptions and we seem to decide or we seem to think we know what's good for them or what they want. Let's not do that. Let's talk to them. Let's listen to them and take that into consideration. While we develop our strategies, programs, investments and policies. And the second one, perceptions are really important. We keep talking about, you know, we keep lamenting how youth are not coming into agriculture at the rate we might like them to. Perceptions play a huge role and we discount the importance of that. Not just of the young people, but of the communities, the families, the societies. So how do we influence that? We've heard of a few things that could help do that. You know, role models and mentorship and music and dance as well. So let's see how we can use those creatively to make that happen. And no discounting the importance of having an effective innovation ecosystem or the enabling environment. We talked about investments, we talked about the nature of education, the kind of education that's needed, formal and informal. Um, so we need to get that right. And something I picked up again from Margaret is, yeah, we keep harping on the constraints and challenges that we have. Often the first thing we go to is land rights, land rights, land rights are important, but there might be ways to get around those. Let's get a bit more creative about those, right? With that, Thank you so much to our panelists for participating in this panel, for sharing your ideas, experiences, and perspectives liberally. Thank you very much. We gained a lot from this. Um, I hope everybody picked up some good ideas and insights from here. Uh, let's give our panel a big hand for being here and doing this for us.